So in the last video, we looked at different examples of the concept of separation of powers being established in UK law. And in this lesson, what I want to do is really ask the question of whether or not there is actually a separation of powers in the UK. Can we actually come to a conclusion on this kind of question? So as an introductory note, there are a number of points that need to be brought up before we ask this question and before we um, look at the for and against points um, relating to this question. Because of the undoubtedly complex nature of the UK's constitution, as we've looked at in previous lessons, the nature of it, the constitution being unwritten, the concept of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty being the most established of all the principles, because of these complex um, uh, equations, there are a number of questions as to whether or not the UK constitution adheres to its basic principles, to not only its own basic principles, but also the basic constitutional principles. So basic constitutional basic constitutional principles. And these are principles that generally um, extend beyond uh, beyond states and to war and you know are generally universal across most constitutions. The idea of separation of powers being one of these principles others being things like the rule of law, the concept of checks and balances, etc, etc. So, when we're looking at this, we have to ask the question as to, because of the, the way the Constitution is formulated, because of the historical development of the UK's Constitution, to what extent does the UK's Constitution adhere to a separation of powers? Lord Stein um, came into this um, debate, as you will, um, in the case R. Anderson and Secretary of State for the Home Department, uh, where he stated that the UK has never embraced a rigid doctrine of separation of powers. So he would sit more on the side of saying no to the question, is there a system of separation of powers? Does the UK truly have this system? So I'm going to say one more time, I'm going to um, reiterate the the concept of the traditional understanding of the separation of powers, and then I'm going to compare that to the UK system of the separation of powers to see how these things can get um, quite complicated. So the traditional understanding of the separation of powers sees something like this. So you have an executive branch, you have a legislative branch, legislative branch and you have a judicial a judicial branch and these branches are separated and that there are a number of checks and balances uh, between the three of them okay now this is a very traditional understanding if we talk about for example the US Constitution however in the United Kingdom we have a system really where we have an executive an executive branch and a legislative legislative branch that are almost fused together okay and we have only separation really um, traditional separation with the judiciary and um, obviously we'll, we'll look at in the in a later video actually um, to what extent there is a separation of powers between these two but we have what is known here as a fusion of powers so we have a fusion of powers okay and so the question really is uh, then if symbolically at least the executive and legislature are fused does that um, translate to a legal fusion of powers are they actually it are they actually fused together and then to what extent does that mean that separation of powers is um, something that exists in the United Kingdom so there are a number of points that could be made as to arguing why there is no separation of powers in the United Kingdom, or at least why there is very little, okay? Because you could, instead of it being a, a, a distinct binary uh, yes or no when talking about the separation of powers, you could suggest that it's a little bit more of a sliding scale, that there is only a little bit of separation of powers. So there are four points that I've made here. One relates to the monarchy, and the monarchy is the primary representation of the fusion of powers. OK, because they are technically um, and legally speaking, the titular head of the executive branch, the legislative branch and the judicial branch of government. So this is, you know, very clearly 
um, in violation almost of the first point, um, the first concept when we looked at the separation of powers, the idea that um, no one um, individual should be allowed to hold power, yield power in all three branches of government. If the monarch is the head of all three, then that technically uh, would suggest that there is not a separation of powers. The second point relates to the work of the Privy Council. We're going to talk about the Privy Council when we move on to the Royal Prerogative um, in a later lesson. But for now, the Privy Council and uh, the Cabinet um, as well. Uh, again, we'll talk about the Cabinet when we talk about the Executive. Um, these two um, bodies uh, hold executive, legislative and judicial powers and contains members from each organ of government. So... Again, another example of two quite um, quite major institutions within within the United Kingdom that um, are a prime representation of of the fusion of powers, not the separation of powers. The third point is that the very fact that the executive sits in Parliament, okay, and um, commands through Parliament, is a symbolic representation of this uh, of the fusion of powers. OK, we don't have a system like in the United States where you have the White House and um, uh, and then you have Congress, which uh, in which case that, you know, they are two separate um, bodies and two separate institutions. No, in this country, we have Parliament and then we have the uh, senior judiciary. OK, the extent to which number 10 Downing Street acts as a single executive um, uh, falls down, really, since um since it is the government and the prime minister and the executive branch um, that sits in parliament a fourth point you could make is that before 2009 even the highest court in the land sat in the house of lords don't forget before 2009 the supreme court didn't really exist and we had the law lords okay and it was only uh, after 2009 and um, through the passing of the constitutional reform act the constitutional uh, the constitutional reform act in 2005 um, that we see this separation between the judiciary legislature and the executive branches so with that being said let's have a look at the final arguments which are the arguments to suggest that while there there may be some fusion of powers in some areas um, for the most part there is a separation of powers in the united kingdom okay now, the first point that could be made is that despite the fact that the executive and the legislature are symbolically fused, i.e. they both they both um, work from the same institution, so they both work from parliament, work from the same institution, the same institution, okay, they nevertheless perform different roles, okay, and they both have separate historical origins okay the way in which the um the 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 late the legal functions of both of these institutions um are clearly separated and so despite the fact that yes um they are symbolically fused together in that they both work from the same institution like i mentioned again this institution being parliament being parliament um, they are still nevertheless separate and then you can talk about the second point, which is the Constitutional Reform Act 2005, what we just brought up earlier on. And the Constitutional Reform Act made a number of changes related to the separation of powers. For example, the first point we've already mentioned, it created a Supreme Court. This was again more symbolic. This was more symbolic. However, it was still very significant. OK, when we're talking about the separation of powers, it showed that there should be a separation between those who create the laws and those who interpret the laws. And it also removed the tripartite role of the Lord Chancellor. Don't forget the Lord Chancellor sat in all three branches of government. OK, so had power, had power in all three, all three branches of government branches of government and for, for for bonus points um put in the comments down below what were his roles in all three of these branches of government if you can um, name them then that'd be very very good so 
the constitutional reform act did a number of things it both did um some kind of some more surface level um approaches to to the separation of powers with the supreme court but then it made a number of genuine constitutional changes when it came to the role of individuals um that seemed to be in violation almost of the, the of one of the principles of the separation of powers okay so to the extent to which we have a separation of powers in the UK is a little bit more complicated than a simple yes or no question, uh, yes or no answer. Compared to the United States, for example, and other constitutions around the world, yes, you could argue that there really isn't a separation of powers because um, the separation of powers in those states are taken very, very seriously. However, in this country, we still have a number of examples where you can see that the roles and duties of different institutions are kept separately.